In summer 1948, Mao makes his master move. Assault by frontal armies in Manchuria. Guerrilla bands emerge from hiding, form up in full divisions, equipped with captured tanks, artillery, and guns. Zhang's garrisons are isolated by ruptured railways, hostile peasants. November 1948, Manchuria falls. Panic begins among the cut-off nationalist garrisons in North China. Surrendering by scores, then thousands, then full divisions, the equipment America has given them falls to the Reds. To America, her second homeland, flies Madame Zhang Kai-shek in November 48 to make a last appeal for further help. But Harry Truman has had enough. Reluctantly, he tells her, American involvement must end. And now the nationalists, pursued by wrath, as they in years gone by did once pursue the communists, gather at Suzhou, last bastion guarding access to the mighty Yangtze's Valley. For two full months, Zhang's troops fight on. In January, cut off, they must surrender. Half a million soldiers lost. The communists pour south. His spirit heavy burdened, Zhang resigns his leadership, hoping other men may court the communists for better terms. On April 1st, the nationalists send emissaries to Peking to plead with Mao Zedong. But they have passed the point of no return. No mercy, say the communists. The new mandate of heaven requires all nationalists to lay down arms within three weeks. Three weeks later to the day, the communists uncoil to cross the Yangtze. First target is Nanking, the hallowed capital of the Kuomintang. But in that capital, the will to fight has turned to dust. No man will stand the ramparts. Abandoning positions, troops trudge away as silent people stand and watch. Too many warring armies have passed this desolate way to make them want to fight for any faith or any politics. No mainland refuge now remains, and fleeing nationalists embark what troops they can to cross the ocean for the island of Formosa. Shanghai hears the message clearly as foreign businessmen board up their shops. Go now, go quickly, for communism marches. Take what you can, but flee. In pell-mell haste, the Western powers evacuate the city they have built, for good and bad alike must leave. The businessmen come for profit, as well as missionaries come to heal, must say goodbye, as out the Yangtze steams the last of Western influence, and farewell to a century. May 27, 1949, down Shanghai's princely avenues, the pleasure boulevards of yesteryear, rolls the victorious red tide. In six more months, all China will submit. Red Star triumphant, hoisted over the world's most ancient nation. Silently, the crowds observe their newest conquerors. Today, in 1967, the marble altars of Peking still beseech the will of heaven as always. Chinese still gather here to listen to the voices that interpret heaven's will. <laughs> For 18 years, this man alone has tried to shape their thinking, has offered them his universal truths, a dogma changeless as Confucius, to freeze their muffled discontent and end their quenchless modern turbulence. The image shown his people has been a teacher, grandfather benign, yet all have learned that those who cannot read his lessons will be crushed. His aging mind still lusts for permanent strife. The theme he preaches to old and young alike is hate. We are small militia men fighting U.S. imperialism. Uncle, we must grow up quick and go to liberate Taiwan. Taiwan, the object of their hate, we call Formosa. This rocky island, 90 miles off the mainland, has many meanings. 
to statesmen, it is the last remaining redoubt of the Guomindang, where Jiang Kai-shek with American arms has re-equipped an army 600,000 strong and dreams reconquest. But Jiang is pawn to American policy. He cannot move these troops or fuel them unless America lets him do so. Now 80, Jiang Kai-shek bespeaks for mainland China another threat. To Formosa in his flight, Zhang has carried the ancient Imperial Museum of Peking, the treasures of 800 years of Chinese art, symbol of another China, beauty past. It is this echo of the past that has bedeviled Mao, who seeks erasure of all past. Yet how Mao's struggle goes, we cannot tell. At the American consulate in Hong Kong, there are cascades, mountains, piles of translations that come in from the Chinese. And these are sandy, gritty, gravelly little bits of information that are meaningless because we don't know who does what to who in Peking. We don't know how they think or how they make up their mind because no matter how hard we study China, we cannot predict such a thing as the Great Leap Forward in 1958. We can't predict such a thing as the Red Guard Purge of 1966 as if there were a struggle of sea monsters going on deep, deep beneath the surface of our vision. And only these bubbles come to the surface to tell us that these are terrible struggles, but we don't know what they're struggling about. Today, in total ignorance, we strain to know of China, as once our ancestors strained to peer across the mysterious wall, not knowing myth from fact. We know industry grows. Steel production swollen 10 times to 12 million tons a year. Light industry soaring. But what comfort it gives the people, we cannot judge. We know beyond this wall live people of dazzling historical ability. The forefathers of these students first invented paper, printing, books, gunpowder, the clock, the compass. In 1967, they loft rockets. In 65, they synthesized insulin. In 64, they unlocked the atom secrets. From behind the wall rise boastful statistics. But we know that China's people hunger have barely survived one of the worst famines in all history. That driven by communist cadres, Peasants work in communes, today still beasts of labor as their fathers were. Within these walls, tyranny has tried to reach beyond the body to the inner recesses of the soul. I woke at midnight and saw my little brother smiling. I asked him why he smiled and he said, I dreamed of Chairman Mao. The purpose of all learning is to fathom what goes on in Chairman Mao's mind. This mind holds all the truths that ever were or will be. Neither age, nor place, nor class has allowed escape from pounding, the chanting of Mao's litany in railroad stations, in stores, at work. Even those who built the wall so long ago must be forgotten, they have been told. No history but Mao's. The aging leaders who shared the hills of hiding 40 years ago, trekked the long march, withstood Japan, America, the Guomindang, must now again pass judgment on their revolution. They writhe and split. Within these walls, they clash. They seek replacement for a chief whose triumphs make him think himself the voice of heaven the universal sage. This is their bomb. In 10 years time, there will be more. The nightmare problem of our time shapes clear, to reach the minds of Mao's successors with reason, before unreasoning bombs 
take up the dialogue. It does no good to mourn the past. We pass along a road of time which, always turning, never brings us back to the crossroads marked again. Perhaps we should never have disturbed the slumbering civilization of China, or else let it wake of itself and reach for us. Perhaps China is too vast to be governed by mercy. Yet if the Chinese mind craves order, they must be brought to recognize they are the biggest factor in the world's disorder. And we must untangle the madness of their mind. The most difficult task in the world is to reach the minds of men who hate you. We do not flinch from the immediate tasks to guard our skies, defend our friends. We cannot flinch from tomorrow's task to reach the mind of China. We race today to reach the moon. To reach that mind is a task of equal difficulty and far greater urgency. <laughs> 